buses leaving from here and taking us to the monastery of San Miguel del Reyes, which is, uh, if I'm not wrong, where the second wife of Ferdinand of Aragon uh, lived for a while after Ferdinand of Aragon died. And it's now the place of the Valencian official national, let's call it, um, library. So it's where the old manuscripts of the Kingdom of Valencia are kept. And so the old literature in, in Catalan of, of uh, produced here in the 15th century is, is kept as well. So it's sort of a, uh, we thought a good place for a conference on information and library sciences uh, to go and have a cocktail. Um, and talking about libraries, we are talking about infrastructures. And this is uh, the topic of uh, the session right now. Um, there's been much talk in recent years about open science and also a lot of talk about infrastructure for open science. So the, the question this afternoon will be about uh, inclusive science as well. Um, and this is important in the context of indicators because the infrastructure for information on science and technology uh, not only has an influence on the patterns of communication, but also on how the indicators then pick up that communication and lead uh, some science to be visible or not. Um, in recent years, there's been new forms of exchanging information, allowing the possibility of more open science uh, with this claims that uh, science is going to be more transparent, cheaper, and more accessible to all researchers and stakeholders and the different publics. Now the question is to which extent this open science is also to be, is also going to be more inclusive and whether these new infrastructures will facilitate wide access to information and knowledge that was previously marginalized. And by this I mean um, journals written by the University of uh, Valencian in Catalan or by the University of Salamanca in Spanish were not usually indexed by the journals, uh, were not usually indexed by the journal indexing system such as a uh, web of science or, and this happened in many places of the world in a variety of disciplines. Um, the previous databases that we had was, were very influenced by the notion of core science. So this was Garfield's notion that if you covered a small number of journals, the core journals, you were getting most of the science that mattered. Um, as it happened, these journals were of international scope and uh, controlled most of the scientific communication, mainly published in a few Western countries. Um, now these databases, such as Web of Science and later Scopus, were used to stratify science in high quality, those appearing in the top journals, um, second tier quality, those in lesser, by second quartile, and then you had a lot of invisible science, all the journals that didn't appear and don't appear yet in, in those top, in, this, in, in, in the main databases. So since, since the 1980s, there have been voices in the communities that were excluded that have um, voiced discontent about this exclusion. I have sitting next to me one of these people. This is Eve Vessuri uh, from Argentina, Venezuela. Um, also other people working in places like the UK but on the social sciences and humanities have um, voiced discontent uh, at this exclusion, the, the invisibility. Um, now the question is whether these new changes in, in information and communication technologies will facilitate the pluralization of scientific information, of the information available in the databases. Um, there have been already a number of initiatives, for example, uh, Cielo, of which we have now here uh, the director, Abel Tucker, and Oredelic in Mexico, that have explicitly worked for filling these gaps. And moreover, the, the advent of open access technologies have 
being able to make local journals accessible across the globe. However, um, accessibility is not the same as visibility. Uh, I would like to point, uh, for example, uh, at the paper last year by Vincent Larivière, which showed that this increased facility for information and communication technologies, rather than leading to a diversification of scientific publishers, has led to concentration, a steep concentration of journals in a few number of publishers. That was a striking fi finding, possibly a, a really important paper for our community, showing that even in um, disciplines such as the social sciences and humanities, the, four, the five top publishers had something like 60% of, or 70% of the uh, total number of papers. So in, in, in this round table, we'd like to discuss uh, these two issues. First, the degree of exclusion in the current system with the current databases. And second, the possibilities that the new infrastructures offer for a pluralization um, and the governance that is needed so that this pluralization of knowledge does take place. Um, let me introduce briefly the, the panel. Uh, sitting next to me, we have uh, Heather Eve Vesuri, which is an Italian name, I'm told. Eve Vesuri, who is a social anthropologist from Argentina and, and Venezuela. She's currently the visiting fellow of the UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mes in Mexico, an emeritus researcher of IVIC, which is the Venezuelan Institute of Scientific Research, and principal investigator of the Argentinian Research Council, uh, CONICET. And as I mentioned before, Eve uh, has been one of the first people and has been working uh, in the last 30 years as one of her topics yeah. on the exclusion of Latin American journals. Um, sitting next to Eve, we have Chris Kin, from who is the head of Library and Scholarly Futures at GISC, uh, the United Kingdom. GISC is the United Kingdom high education, further education and skill sector, not for profit organization which deals for digital services and solutions. Uh, Chris was a manager at the University of Sussex until 2015 and then moved to GISC. Um, then we have here um, Valentin Bogorov, who is head of the Thomson Reuters IP and science training team in Russia and other post-Soviet uh, countries. Uh, prior to joining Thomson Reuters, Valentin had taught in Russia, the US, and did consultancy for organizations, organizations such as the World Bank. And uh, we invited uh, Thomson Reuters to the table because in December, uh, there was the launch of the Russian Citation Index. And we'd like to hear um, Thomson Reuters um, organization in terms of a core set of journals and the different regional citation indexes. And then we have Eric Archambault, uh, who is the president and founder of Science Metrics, a bibliometrics and evaluation consultancy based in Montreal. Eric founded recently a company which is called One Science, which facilitates the search of open access articles. We hope to have more details from him. Um, he has a doctorate from the University of Sussex, uh, SPRU. And uh, last but not the least, we have Abel Parker, who is the director of Scientific Electronic Library Online, which you might know as Cielo, um, which is funded by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. Um, he was the director of the Latin American and Caribbean Center on Health Sciences, BIREME, of the Pan American Health Organization. Um, and uh, so he's been working on setting up infrastructures in the case of health for um, information sciences. Um, having done the introductions, I'd like to, st to start the discussion with Ebe about the, the notion of exclusion of Latin American journals, or journals of other regions of the world in general. Um, because there is, we, we have quite a bit of evidence of the degree of to which some areas, some countries such as the Netherlands, the UK, have their journals included in the databases 
Some countries like France and Spain have some degree of inclusion and other countries um, like Cuba or Peru have a, a, an extremely low coverage. Um, to which extent do you see the potential for more comprehensive databases being developed? And what would be the, what, to which extent do you see that in having these more comprehensive databases might lead to more visibility of these other journals? Uh, well, I, I was reading in uh, a blog from the London School of Economics uh, last week, um, a, a, a material was produced by some people from here, from, from Valencia, on the uh, visibility or invisibility of uh, Latin American scientific production. And uh, the authors were, were arguing that there was some, some um, mistakes or some uh, absences uh, in, the, in, in the way that uh, uh, databases were presented in the regions and were structured in the region that worked against it in terms of uh, making, making them more visible internationally. And, and while well, they were talking about other uh, details of, of infrastructure, which I think that they, they may very well be correct. But uh, I would like to, um, to, to go a bit uh, um, to the past in history. Uh, when, because today we are living the results of, uh, of actions, of decisions, of uh, processes that uh, took place over a, a protracted uh, effort of many people to, uh, to modernize uh, science, in, in, in developing context to uh, implant modern science in many of these uh, countries that supposedly didn't have science and to institutionalize scientific disciplines, scientific institutions and so on. That was something that in Latin America took place in earnest in, in the 1960s and 1970s, from the 1950s onwards. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, there was already that problem of how can we become more visible? I remember that when I went to, to I spent several years in Brazil, uh, going from Venezuela, uh, and I had to define a research project uh, for, to present to uh, the Sao Paulo Science Agency, that they funded me, and uh, my, my topic at that time was uh, strategies to become more visible. Uh, uh, among scientists from Latin America uh, in terms of their publication, precisely because invisibility was already a problem. But it's, it's really would be interesting to realize very strongly that uh, Latin American scientists, among other groups in, in, in the developing world, uh, being so much aware, they were among the very um, first people of the earliest group that really joined the effort of open access with, with uh, great enthusiasm. Uh, and, uh, and even today, I think that uh, the, the numbers, relatively speaking, of journals that are open access in, in the region are comparatively stronger than other regions. But um, that doesn't help Con the continuation of invisibility. So we must look at something else. It's not just open access or the possibility of having journals in open access that uh, solves uh, questions. And unfortunately, we had the convergence of two trends in history, two contingent trends, I think, but they, nevertheless, they collide, they, they collisioned. Uh, it was this trend of the scientists to become visible and since there was no money available for them to have the, big, the good journal, the big journal, then they said, well, let's go electronic. Now we have the chance. New technology, let's go with that. But on the other hand, the science councils that were organized and, and that they said, well, look, look, we have to adopt good management uh, procedures, and we have to be really serious and, and rigorous and, and modern, they went for the gold standard of um, Tom's of Rogers, <laughs> the size citation index of those days, uh, and, and uh, started to apply the criteria of, uh, of publication in a very, very rigorous and narrow way. 
they are dependent on, on also on, on uh, internal political, domestic political issues, if you wish, uh, whether the physicists were in control or the, or the chemists or the medical doctors, the different groups in the various Latin American countries, but anyway, they uh, imposed uh, or generalized a way of assessing research, of evaluating research that went in one direction and we had the digital revolution and the scientists trying to go uh, initially on, in another direction. But since the funding money from the Science Council uh, put the rules of the game, then we know that uh, people are very clever and scientists are very clever. They are as, as clever as, as any other citizen in, in their own country, so they learn the rules, the new rules of the game, and so they started to play that game. And that means then uh, invisibility for many other things, not just for people, but for topics. And I think that that is the most serious thing that we have to take into account, whether the, uh, the non-visible journals and, and the lagging behind journals and those uh, journals without papers uh, almost, no, that sometimes we have, although there are journals that are uh, quite successful in, in their own countries or in, their, in the regions and are not in the big databases. Uh, what, what are we missing? Are we really missing something important? Are we not missing it? One um, solution that has been given to the problem is simply that what is not in the mainstream journals doesn't have any importance. But uh, we would argue differently for uh, our countries. And we think that for science in general and for on the planet in general, and is it being obvious today when even uh, uh, the uh, um, biodiversity uh, convention includes information that is not being published in mainstream journals or is not being published in journals, but it's, it's you have some kind of witness, written witness, or some knowledge that is available, and you have to use it because it's important knowledge for science. So we, uh, today we have the technological apparatus in order to um, in make this possible. Should we be using then this thing in order to have really inclusive science, open and inclusive and collaborative science. No? Um, perhaps uh, Eric Archambault, um, who has been doing uh, research in the last uh, years on open access, and I assume also using statistics could, could tell us about the degree of which he thinks that there is invisibility or, or not, and lack of, of possibility for, for pluralizing the access. Thank you, Ismail. Uh, listening uh, to what I just heard, I, I think I'm, I might uh, repeat a bit the, the same, uh, the same uh, topic. Uh, perhaps uh, just uh, going uh, back in time uh, with some historical precision, and perhaps dreaming a bit, a little bit about uh, the future. Uh, but what is certain is that uh, the way the databases we use today uh, to perform bibliometric studies are, are, market, are marketed. Uh, supposedly tells us that researchers only want to find papers from mainstream journals, only from the best journals, and, uh, and that also that bibliometricians are happy to use this. Well, I've been doing bibliometrics for 25 years now, a bit more than that actually, and uh, <clears throat> I've been really frustrated for the last 15 and uh, increasingly frustrated. I don't think our tools are neutral. And, uh, and th the big problem, actually, is that we don't know the extent to which they are good or not because they're very difficult to characterize. Because to know if you're good or not, you have to know what you're missing. And at the moment, it's difficult to know what we're missing. So my argument here is that uh, it's not a, a, a desirable feature for scholarly work to concentrate on the most highly cited journal, and it's not a good one either for bibliometrics. My argument, and also this is what we're doing at uh, One Science, I think everything that is a peer-reviewed journal, a scholarly journal, peer review being an umbrella here for whatever is a quality assess journal, because in the humanities is a different process. We're talking about uh, quality assessment is what should be included in a database. 
And when you think of the two main uh, bibliographic database which are used in bibliometrics today, uh, their origins really in the way they're built is in the 1920s. In the 1920s, uh, there, there were uh, authors called Gross and Gross, uh, probably a couple. I never looked at uh, who were the two Grosses. Uh, but they did work, and their question was, how do we select the most relevant journals for a library? And they looked at citation. That's how it all started. So in the late 1920s, they did their work in the, in the, the area of chemistry, but basically what they did uh, had universal applications. And, and, and this is where it all started and where this technique improved over time. There were several authors who brought some improvement and eventually it led to the way that uh, the, the journal citation report worked and how the journals were selected for this and how, it was how the scores were computed, with changes over time, of course. But the reason it was important to do this is because when you're a librarian, you have a price barrier. You can't subscribe to every journal. So there's a good reason to know which one you're going to subscribe to because you want to find something that is relevant and have some sense of cost effectiveness. Now, when Eugene Garfield started to, to work for ways of building a citation database, which is something he started really in the 1950s, I think his initial thoughts was around 1955, perhaps a bit before, but he started at that time. He, he faced also some barriers. It wasn't a, a, a price barrier like the librarians who are trying to subscribe. He had some technical and, and price barriers. The computers at the time were extremely pricey and the storage capacity was extremely limited. Just to give you a sense of this, in 1956, uh, IBM was the first one to introduce uh, a hard drive. At the time, this hard drive was that high and that wide, it had 50 platters of 24 inches. And just to give you a sense, with this you could store four, five meg. Nowadays in iWatch, and not the new model that was introduced two weeks ago, they both have the same capacity. It can store eight gig internally. That's, uh, you, you're speaking of something that is 1600 times more storage than the initial ones. And even, Eugene couldn't afford that because that was overly pricey. So that was like the dream. He was probably thinking perhaps in a few years time, in 10 years or 15 years, I'll be able to afford one. So he, he couldn't take all the journals because of this, but also there were some other issues. He didn't have access to all the journals. I mean, no library in the world has access to all the journals and certainly starting his company, he didn't have access to. And uh, so that's very important. And another aspect is that he didn't have all the language skills to actually use the data in these journals. And still today, it's a reality when you look at uh, the bibliographic databases that we're using, sometimes you will find that some journals in the in uh, Asian languages are included, but you, when you look at the reference, it's written simply reference in a foreign language or something of the kind. So that means that still today, we don't have the linguistic tools to um, compute this. But the, the problem I think that we have is that we've, we've maintained this regime in place, this idea that after all was stemming from a difficulty to be inclusive because of technical reasons, but also because of linguistic reasons, we heard that it was, a, I think it was a translation of the problem in something practical for marketing. You want only these journals, but that the, were the only journals they could actually bring to you. So there's a problem that there was a selection as opposed to inclusiveness, but there was also the problem that in the initial set of journals that, he, that Eugene had when he did this work, he had a majority of them which were in the English language. 
And then he looked at that, ignoring all the rest. He looked at the citation, and of course these journals were citing the same set he used, and he said, these are the relevant journals. Had he done that in a Japanese library or in a Russian library of the time, the set of journals that would have been called relevant would have been different. There shouldn't be a doubt about it. And, and these tools became very important in shaping the world of science. We can't underestimate how the journal citation report has shaped what we think of what is mainstream science. And all the countries are contributing to it. Even the countries, I think, which suffer the most from it are the ones who are promoting it the most. most. Yeah. Because of ignorance <coughs> in the ministries of education, they're saying, oh, you have to publish in the journal. There isn't the journal citation report. Otherwise, it's worth nothing. So it's a self-defeating strategy. Now, move on 50 years later. Th there's no doubt that a lot of things have changed. We, we have a lot of emerging power in, in science nowadays. The South is producing way more than it was 50 years ago. Eastern countries have, you know, they're overtaking uh, the West now. But still we have a problem. We still have this database which hasn't changed much. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's amazing to see how little it has changed in its philosophy and it's what it's marketing. And you know, when you think about it, we, we are so ignorant of what we are talking about. If you ask most of the information scientists, the librarians, people in bibliometrics, how many peer-reviewed journals there are on the planet, well, first, no one has an idea about the real answer. And, and uh, most of them will tell you, don't know, or they'll tell you 25, 35,000 journals. And where are they getting it from? Ulrich Web, which is a source of knowledge on journals, which has the same bias <laughs> as the, the journal citation report and the, and the Web of Science. And I, I know it because I'm, I'm a native French speaker, and when I look at a lot of journals being published in France, they're not considered as a peer-reviewed journal, and you go on the site and it says, cette revue est revue par les pairs. So you, you, you know it's not covering the stuff right if it's not written in English. But the answer is that we have at least doubled that. At One Science, we've been building a database of peer-reviewed journals, and uh, we're now at 60,000. So the web of science comprises 12,000 journals in its core collection. That's a fifth of what we have at the world level. I think nowadays, considering the technology that we have, we no longer have an excuse to say we want only the core. The answer is we want it all, actually. At the moment, if you take the latest generation of hard drive that are being marketed, that eight terabyte. If you take all the articles that have been written to date since the beginning of humanity, and you take only the text, they all fit on that hard drive. We have billions of them on the planet. We no longer have an excuse to be restricted. And the last item, I know I'm, I'm speaking for a bit too long, was the language issue. It was a bit of a problem. It still is, but it's changing fast. You go in Google Translate nowadays, you throw some text in a foreign language, and you can by and large understand what's going on. Now.